about time to uh, relate some of my World War II experiences. Before it's too late, I better get at it. Um, this may be interest to my children or my grandchildren, and uh, I like to relate it as it was, as best I can remember it. I enlisted in the United States Naval Construction Battalion in October of the year 1943. I went in as electrician's mate first class. I asked the recruiting officer would I have any reason to take my horn. He looked at me and said, by all means, yes. After a physical examination in Salt Lake City and passing it and so forth, I found myself aboard a troop train headed for Camp Perry, Virginia, where I was to undergo my boot training. I arrived in Camp Perry, Virginia, perhaps about the middle of November of 1943. I only wish I had kept a log of things. So I've just got to take this to you off the top of my head. It seemed like I had little more than arrived at Camp Perry, Virginia, when my name came over the intercom to report to the officer of the day on the double. I thought to myself, I hope I'm not in trouble already of some kind. Upon arriving at the officer of the day's desk, I said, or he said to me, Nelson, your junket shows that you're a trumpet player. By chance, do play a bugle. Could you bugle? I said, that is true, sir. I could. However, I'm not familiar with all the colors. He said, do you read uh, with all the calls, I should say. He said, do you read music? I said, I certainly do. So I was assigned to bugle detail. Now, that had some advantages, let me assure you, because uh, such as getting into early child and omitting a lot of the drill practice on the drill field as to uh, playing the morning colors and uh, in the evening, playing the evening colors. And it wasn't long after that as I was assigned to organize and direct a boot band as the boots would come into Camp Perry, Virginia if they played an instrument of some kind and could do it quite well. Why? I had the opportunity of recruiting them and placing them in a band under my direction, a boot band. Now this band uh, may have varied from time to time from uh, personnel as guys were transferred out and so forth, but I did have a, a real good boot band and uh, I was able to get the, the fellows who were in this band uh, omitted from any uh, outside duty other than band. Now, Camp Perry, Virginia was a pretty good-sized place, and we had uh, what they called smokers in the service, uh, more or less uh, kind of a little stage show of music for all the, the mates that were there. And needless to say, music played an important part to man in the armed forces to, as to building his morale. Uh, so I was kept quite busy at that, and during the noon hour, I had a, what they called a little chow, chow hall band, this consisted of uh, trumpet, uh, accordion, saxophone, drums, and, and maybe clarinet. And we would uh, go from mess hall to mess hall throughout the area and uh, play a concert while the mates were eating chow. Now this went over very well, and it had some, uh, some fringe benefits because uh, when the master of uh, arms who run the uh, particular area there as to a chow hall, if he knew we were coming, why, maybe he would uh, fix something kind of nice for us. And uh, uh, how well I recall as to oysters, uh, Camp Perry being very close to, to uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay, we had lots of oysters. And I, I really, really did like oysters too, fried oysters and what have you. Well, anyway, uh, I was fortunate of being placed in the ship's company because I stayed there at Camp Perry, Virginia until the base was closed and made a regular Navy base. How well I recall Christmas there. And out of the band that I had, why, uh, 
I organized a trumpet trio, and we went around through the various barracks playing White Christmas and Christmas carols, and needless to say that that brought tears to a lot of the guys' eyes, and uh, myself, I was almost a little bit teary-eyed, uh, knowing that I had a good wife at home and two loving daughters. Well, anyway, uh, Ship's Company proved out quite well for me because uh, I well recall that uh, a long time during the boot period training, why I had thought I was going to freeze to death. Man, it was cold. But after I got into Ship's Company, why, uh, you know, the certain restrictions why, uh, could be overlooked, and I found myself sleeping much warmer. I think we must have cut down about half the forest around there during the boot training period trying to keep warm. I have a lot of fond memories of Camp Perry, Virginia. The band I had was booked out occasionally into Williamsburg where we played dances for uh, some of the civilians. And uh, it, was, it was a good time. And I had some nice letters of recommendation for my work in camp. So perhaps my stay at Camp Perry, Virginia was from the middle of November 1943, perhaps until, I'm just going to take a wild guess of right here, until very likely about the 1st of May. Uh, at that time, the base was closed down as to being a CB base and was made a regular Navy base. So uh, I found myself aboard a troop train headed for Davisville, Rhode Island, which is very close to Providence. Little did I know what the future held for me there, whether I would be signed to an outgoing battalion to form my duties as electrician's mate, uh, of which uh, uh, was my rating, or what, I didn't know. But upon my arrival there, I guess the word had got around, and uh, I was assigned to a very fine band which was kept together all through World War II as a unit. The band was under the direction of Charlie Brinkley at that time, a little later to be taken over by George Libracci. Uh, upon hearing this band, I was very well pleased that I had been assigned to this band. And in the band was a couple of uh, fellows that I had known from Camp Perry. Perhaps they, they uh, passed the word along that I was coming. Uh, which was Charlie Rudica at trombone and uh, my good longtime friend George Bernie Warner. They were already assigned to this band. So there was a couple of guys there that I knew in the band. Uh, I mentioned to uh, George that I hadn't had any embarkation leave, and uh, that's normal that you do get an embarkation leave after boot training, but I didn't get one. And I was so terribly homesick that I, I told George, I can't do you much good until I get a leave. It was arranged that I did get a boot leave, and so home I did come for 10 days. Now, that 10 days went by in a big hurry. Fortunately, as to me being in ship's company, the band being assigned ship's company, I was able to bring Grace back there with me to Rhode Island, where she spent some time until a little later on, until we were uh, to be... Uh, leaving there as, as to the unit. Uh, we left the two daughters with Grace's mom in Salt Lake, and we knew they were well taken care of. So my 10-day visit didn't uh, give me much of a chance to visit any place. Most of it was going and coming on that train, as you can well imagine. Well, <clears throat> as to the band in, uh, in uh, Camp Thomas, uh, we were kept very, very busy marching troops to the train and... and uh, playing war loan drives throughout the New England states. This was uh, this band really did a service to mankind. So it was learned that we were to be uh, leaving. We didn't know where, but uh, we were headed for the West Coast at Camp Parks. We had received our order, so it was home for Grace. So after uh, bidding her goodbye, fortunately, we found housing for her when we arrived there, which was fairly close to the base, and I got to see her quite often. And she did get to see quite a bit of, of the New England states while she was there. And she met up with a couple other Navy wives, so uh, she had a good vacation out of it. 
I was pleased that uh, Charlie Brinkley was able to accompany Grace as far as Chicago after receiving his medical discharge. Why uh, he went back to his home in Chicago and uh, he saw to it that Grace was put on the proper train to Chicago and he was good company for her. That pleased me. Well, we learned uh, again, like I say, that uh, we were heading out and uh, we were told, the members of the band, to uh, pack up all our instruments, our own private instruments, and send them home because we would be issued new GI equipment. And uh, so I had my pick of some trumpets. I tried two or three out of them, and I settled on a busher. And it was a good horn. I had it with me all through World War II. Okay, I would say about right about here, maybe when we left Camp Perry, I beg your pardon again, Camp Thomas, Davisville, Rhode Island, <coughs> we uh, were assigned to a battalion, the 128th NCB Battalion. And uh, like I say, we were heading for the West Coast, Camp Parks, we didn't know from what or where after that. Upon arriving at Camp Parks, this was probably about the middle of of November, I would say, that we left uh, uh, Camp Thomas. So upon uh, arriving at Camp uh, Parks, why, uh, we uh, were assigned duty there, and we played some engage engagements around that part of the country as to the band, and we were busy rehearsing and what have you. Fortunately, while at Camp Parks, I was granted another 10-day leave. And this time it wasn't so bad because uh, I was able to fly from from uh, San Francisco to Boulder City, right into Boulder City via TWA. So I had a nice little uh, little vacation with my wife and two daughters before shipping out for the island of Oahu. Uh, we found ourselves aboard ship probably about the latter part of of November. And uh, it took 12 days to uh, get from uh, San Francisco to the island of Oahu, Pearl Harbor. Uh, this being wartime, this is a zigzag course, and it took quite a little time. There was about 10 ships in this convoy, and uh, something I'll never forget, and that is eating aboard a troop ship. No such a thing as sitting down. You stood up at long mess tables. And uh, the sleeping quarters and everything were very congested. And the chow, as estimated, took about 30 seconds per person to eat. And how many guys did I see hit the side of the ship up there and lose all their cookies after eating? We played some engagements aboard that ship with the band, some band concerts up on the deck. And uh, upon our arrival in... Pearl Harbor, uh, such devastation that, as I did see that the Japs had caused. We were sound housing on Iroquois Point, or barracks I should say, and we remained on the island of Oahu for almost 30 days. While there, we again were assigned duty. We played all over the island of Oahu. And fortunately, I got to see much of the island of Oahu. It was a beautiful island. But we knew that we were not there for very long. I, uh, we, I wrote and told Grace after being told that we were going to go to the island of Guam. They censored all your mail, so you couldn't uh, get anything too much across. But I thought maybe she'd get this if I mentioned to her that they had all kinds of her favorite chewing gum in the ship store there, clove, uh, clove gum. Well, I thought maybe that'd give her a cl clue that I was going to Guam, but she never did get it. So here we go now, and I'm, uh, this kind of brings me up on, on uh, my, uh, what I have to say. But from here on out, now I'm going to revert to a log that was written by Kenny Stilwell. I recently received a nice letter from Kenny after sending him a, a cassette tape of our band that was recorded on WXLI Guam in the year of 1945 as of about September or perhaps October. And uh, 
Kitty sent me back a letter telling me how he thrilled he was to have received that tape. Uh, the state came all about because uh, Dora happened to be going through a bunch of George belongings and she come across two or three real tapes and that were recorded on Guam. She asked me if I'd like to have them and I told her I would be delighted. So uh, I made a cassette copy of this band, Music Under the Stars. The United States Navy presents Music Under the Stars. We put a weekly broadcast on the island of Guam. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of things here right now. We'll get to that later. So anyway, from here, I'm going to relate to you Kenny Stillwell's log. Fortunately, he kept a log on everything all the way through. So I'm just going to kind of read it as it was, as to the dates and everything. And uh, we'll just take it from there. As of December the 30th, we boarded an LST, the Big Iron Mary, number 70 and we left Guam on that day. We had 400 Marines aboard, which we dumped off at Saipan when we got there. We passed the, uh, the south of the Johnston Island, and I well recall seeing the island of Maui and uh, Molokai from, from a distance. Uh, and uh, we passed Kwajalein Island, and we spent the night in the harbor at Anawitok, we sailed from Anawitok for Saipan. Uh, most of the time we were at sea. We arrived at Saipan, and uh, we stayed in the harbor overnight and arrived at Guam on the 19th of January. We went ashore to begin our camp. And from there on, all through the month of January, we were busy as to camp construction. And at that time, I find myself doing some electrical work as to wiring up the tents and so forth. So that was a little diversion. It was different than playing the music. So as of February, then we got into it pretty good with our music. We played all over the entire island. We played for the natives. We played for every denomination you could think of. It was in the service. And uh, as I've said before, uh, music meant so much to the morale of man. And WXLI, which is a radio station on Guam, we played weekly broadcasts from there, which were heard around the uh, entire island and, and perhaps throughout the Marianas and maybe some parts of the South Pacific. We played Eddie in all kinds of engagements, if you can imagine. Like I say, not only for Navy, but for Army, for the Marines, and for ship repair units, and what have you. Uh, let's see. Uh, also, there were some USO shows that came there, and occasionally we, we played for some of those. Uh, we played a lot of BOQs, dances, for small band combinations, of which I happen to be a member each, as to each one of those. Uh, we st also strolled through the various hospitals playing the mate's requests, and I'm sure we did much for their morale. So uh, the month of March moves along, and like I say, we're very busily engaged playing music. Uh, now, we not only had our swing band, which was the Music Under the Stars broadcast, but we also had a military band. We played colors, and we marched troops to uh, various destinations and what have you. This band was kept very busy. Oh, and I see here, uh, we played a uh, concert in Aganya, and Andy Damian, who was a native, I won't remember Andy well, he was a clarinet player. He, um, uh, during the uh, invasion of the Japs, they held him prisoner. And he had private, uh, previously been in the Navy band there, of all natives, and it was going to be in the uh, reorganization program here. So Andy was a nice guy and a good musician, so I hope everything turned out good for him. We also played around the world broadcast for uh, the seventh war loan drive, and I recall as to this particular thing, I had a, a featured spot. I did a little local in Jive on a tune called We Got Fish for Supper, and uh, this this. Uh, broadcast went around the world. Uh, one day we found uh, 
Dick Jurgens, who had a very fine Marine band, in our chow hall. He and his band eating chow and digging our band. Now, Dick had a very fine Marine band, but I don't think it was any better than the band we had. In fact, I don't think he had as many vocalists and what so as we did have. Uh, so, uh, like I say, we were kept very, very busy. And here's another thing we saw uh, Claude Thornhill. He had a very fine Navy band, I recall. And with him was a couple of featured guys. He had Tommy Riggs, Jackie Cooper, and Dennis Day. How do you, how do you go for that? And uh, so we we did get to see quite a few celebrities over there that came over in USO packages and what have you. As I've mentioned before, this band kept very very busy. Uh, this quartet, the Pontoon Airs, they were kept busy too. They sang. Um, in various church programs, and uh, as well as were featured on our WXLI broadcasts. Uh, the natives, I will recall, we played many concerts for the natives, and uh, I recall them fixing some sandwiches and GI lemonade for us and so forth after, after we had played a concert. The parents would do that, uh, just to show their appreciation. I will recall playing a... Uh, a dance in a schoolhouse that it just had, it was full of holes. Uh, the Japs were holed out there, and these holes uh, were made by machine gun fire from our own planes rerouting the Japs. And if you don't think those girls could dance, those, uh, <coughs> those girls on Guam, they really loved to dance, and they moved but good. So uh, they were well chaperoned any time that they came to... Uh, participate in the dance program. Uh, military band plays for plays show for 94 CBs. Commander Smallwood attended. What a fine man he was, Commander Small, Smallwood. I remember him well. The twin band, I well recall, are playing aboard a big uh, a subtender, USS Fulton. Now, a subtender was fully equipped with a mach machine shop and all kinds of provisions to take care of a submarine that would come in there for repairs and restocking of food and so forth. And they could accommodate uh, as many as a half a dozen tied up alongside. Now, this was really something because we had the opportunity of uh, going through a submarine. And I can sure tell you for sure that uh, submarine duty would, uh, wouldn't have been my choice because it was so confining. You know, a, a sub would go out, and if it didn't hear from it after 30 days, why, it would be uh, taken as to be lost. Now, a sub could never send messages, I was told, but they could receive but not send. So that was quite a thrill to uh, go all through a submarine and have everything explained to us. And, of course, they had a moving pictures aboard the, the subtender. And incidentally, as to many of these places where we did play, there was oftentimes a, a movie was shown after, after our performance, and we would stay and, uh, you know, view the movie. I will recall as to uh, the North Field, which was a B-29 base, the B-29s flying out for Japan, uh, we talked one time to uh, uh, one of the crew aboard uh, these uh, bombers. And uh, he told us all about a target as to Kobe, Japan. He said that it was literally destroyed. And I feel right there that, uh, you know, it wouldn't have taken much more to bring the Japs to their senses. Maybe maybe a uh, atomic bomb was not needed. Guam is a pretty island with a little bit of an elevation to it. The, mount, the highest peak there is a thousand feet, Mount Tenya, and uh, many little native villages throughout the island. And of course, uh, as pre mentioned here, we played all over the entire island. And even after the war was over, why, uh, it was so densely covered with jungle that many Japs just refused to believe that the war was over. And uh, they hung right in there. 
In fact, I heard of one uh, years later, 15 years later, that uh, he finally come out and surrendered. So they could live off the land with roots and whatever have you. But as I recall, when we'd go back in some of those boondock areas to play, and maybe we wouldn't get back to our base till after dark, why we, we carried our rifles just in the event that we might have had some problems with Japanese. However, I'm pleased to say that I never had to pull the trigger on one of them. But I did see a lot of the little buggers uh, there that were being worked as to road details and so forth, Japanese prisoners. And uh, I didn't feel sorry for them after all what they did to us. And I think they were pretty well treated. Uh, it was funny to, to see some of them ask a maybe this Marine sergeant who was in charge of the detail for an American cigarette, he'd tell him, I'll give you a cigarette, but before I do, you bow and tell me that Dojo eats that stuff. S-H-I-T. I might say, uh, myself being the only electrician in the band, why occasionally maybe we'd get back to play for a bunch of Marines and uh, they wouldn't know what was expected. And of course, we'd have to have a little covering because you never knew when it was going to break down and rain. So maybe uh, they throw up a little uh, uh, tarp canopy over the bandstand, uh, and you can imagine what a bandstand would look like, the coconut palms and a few tuba twelves and what have you. But we made the best of all those things, and maybe we would need lights. So me being the only electrician, I would ask uh, one of the Marine sergeants, have you fellows got a motor generator set? Well, we can get one. Okay, if you get it, because we need lights. And when they brought it back, why, well, maybe I would haywire a couple of lights together and uh, start the motor generator set and uh, jump into the whites and play the concert. There was other times, too, like with Lloyd Ellis, his guitar. I'm not a technician when it comes to that kind of work, is he to his amplifier, but I could always take it to some army technician someplace on the island who could make a necessary repair. So this band was kept very, very busy. We had a, a band tent, and uh, we, we rehearsed like mad. And we even had one of the guys in the band was a musical repairman. So if you had a, 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 a saxophone that needed to be repadded, he could take care of it, or a stuck valve on a trumpet, or what have you. He had the equipment and know-how to, to take care of it. We had arrangers in this band, uh, Charlie McConnell, who was with WG in Chicago, and uh, Don Dalen, Charlie Rudica, Kenny Stilwell, uh, Ray Fritz. We had a any number of guys that could write arrangements. And this was a very well-rehearsed band. And it, were it being recorded today under the mo modern facilities of how great it would sound. But anyway, Kenny was so pleased with this tape, and of course so was McConnell. I sent one to Lloyd Ellis also, but have not heard from him as yet. But uh, I didn't want to keep this log of Kenny's too long. I just wanted to thumb through it and, uh, you know, tell you a few of the interesting things that he did have down here. And, of course, all of it's very interesting. Now he's got down here on August the 10th, it was a 10.30 a.m. radio report, Jam, Japan offers to surrender if Emperor, if Emperor remains. Lots of yelling and incite, excitement in the camp. How about that? Boy, my golly. Yeah, so maybe that was the start of it right there when we were, were going to get things to moving. Four powers, Britain, Russia, and China reply. J Japan center will, surrender will be accepted. Emperor to remain as nominal head. Will take observe for allied administrator to be appointed. So things were starting to roll. Now, that was on August 11th, 45. Okay. So uh, here he goes on the 13th. Japan does not confirm that Allied message has been received. So uh, we're still hanging on to see what happens. Uh, as of the 15th of August, we got some action then. That... Uh, the military band plans in place in the beer garden, big celebration. And uh, 
Well, I can recall the guys were so thrilled and everything, they actually tore their pants off each other in their shirts. So it looked like it was about getting over for us. Uh, first broadcast, when we went, when we weren't known as simply George Labracci and the Music Under the Stars men, operating, opening in the past has always been fanfare, and the United States Navy presents. So things changed a little bit, you know, as we went along. Now, I might say this. Uh, Admiral Nimitz gave the order to our commanding officer to jack up every CB in that band a rent who was eligible because they hadn't had a chance to work at their respective trades and earn a rate. So fortunately, I was made a chief electrician and George Labracci a chief storekeeper. So it goes on all through the month of August and September telling about our broadcast where we played. And like I say, it would take a book to write each and every one of them. Uh, here he says on uh, on August the 31st, WXLI broadcast, medley used for the first time on the air, included I Miss Your Kiss, I Promise You, Into Each Life Some Rain Must Fall, and All of My Life, and the pontooners were the featured vocalists in that group. So uh, going on, going on, like I say, we're getting down close to the end of the thing here where I can't comment too much more but uh, I will recall as to uh, as to our journey coming to Guam that uh, we passed very close to the Marshalls, uh, Marshall Islands now those were Japanese held but I don't think we had too much to worry about because uh, they wouldn't waste a tin fish on a little LST incidentally we had two other LSTs in our, on our, in our little group that traveled side by each uh, to Guam. So, uh, like I say, uh, doggone it, things were really happening. And as of November the 4th, George Labracci, myself, uh, McConnell, Rufo, Reed, Novak, we left Guam. We boarded ship for home. So that was uh, the end of the uh, Guam episode right there. And I well recall as to uh, our detail on the ship, luckily we lucked out because we were given a music detail. And George and myself both were a little bit somewhat worried as to, uh, you know, being both uh, boot chiefs that we might get a detail of about 12 men each. Uh, and be told to clean the heads or some other uh, duty that wasn't so desirable. So George, uh, being the diplomat that he is, he lost no time in getting to the chaplain, and he sold him on the idea that we should play a, uh, a little happy hour on deck each day. And they went for that. So that was real nice. Uh, so we had enough in our compliment, George, myself, and uh, Mac, and, and Rufo with his accordion, that we could get by with a small combination. And also there was a black drummer aboard this ship by the name of Kansas Fields who'd worked with Ella Fitzgerald, and he played with us. So it was so nice. Now, it took 12 days from uh, Guam to get to San Pedro. Uh, I well recall as to the uh, officers. They liked the music so well. They said to George, why don't you guys come up and play at our mess hall at night? George said, we'd like to, but... Uh, doesn't coincide with our child. Well, he said, come on up and eat with us. Well, that's what George was after. <clears throat> so we had a delightful time, uh, you know, all, all the way back uh, playing music. Oh, and incidentally, I might mention, I said to our commanding officer as to uh, the horn that I had, I said, gee, I'd sure like to take this horn with me because I'd be lost. Uh, you know, I'm going to lose my chops if I don't do a little blowing. Uh, he said, well, take it. We'll scratch it off the inventory. So I came home with that butchered horn. And uh, so <clears throat> anyway, when we got to San Pedro, why, there was a uh, watch. Oh, I, sh I should say that we were supposedly to go into San Francisco, but there was a strike, which took us into San Pedro. 
So uh, after we got off the ship at San Pedro, and how could I ever forget the Salvation Army throwing milk up to the guys on board the ship and how good milk did taste. And throw your telegrams over the side. We'll mail them home, which they did. So we had to take a troop train from there to go clear up to uh, uh, Camp Shoemaker out of San Francisco to receive our discharge. So, uh, like I say, here it took November the 4th. Uh, it took 12 days to uh, to get to San Pedro, and then probably a couple of days from there up to San Francisco. I don't quite recall. But anyway, I did arrive home in time for Thanksgiving. And my good friend George, he and I shook hands right about there, and uh, we said goodbye to each other, but uh, we kept in close contact over all those years. And I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experiences I did have. Uh, however, I don't think I'd want to do it again, and especially at my age. But this was truly a great band with some very fine, outstanding musicians, and I'm so happy that we, we could remain together as a unit through our wartime days. We did much for mankind, I am certain. And I'm thinking right here it might be wise that I give you the personnel of this band. George Liberace was the director. He was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Don Dalen, saxophone and vocals, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Andy Scubish, sax and vocals, Gary Edney, Anna. Sid Clarkson, sax, Duncan, Oklahoma. Maurice Buckley, sax and vocals, Nashua, New Hampshire. Kenneth Stilwell, sax, Decatur, Illinois. Bob Babbitt, sax and vocals, St. Louis, Missouri. Art Novak, flute, Denver, Colorado. Backing up to Stilwell, he did some vocals also. Uh, Charles Rudica, trombone and vocals. Al Fitzgerald, trombone and vocals. Ray Fritz, trombone and vocals. Now, there's some versatile guys here. Fritz played piano and organ, and and uh, likewise did uh, did Kenny Stillwell. So we had a lot of versatile guys in this band. George Bernie Warner, trumpet. Uh, Waltham Mass. Uh, Tommy Nelson, trumpet and vocals, Las Vegas, Nevada. Edgar Reed, trumpet, Keene, New Hampshire. Gordon Ketchin, trumpet, Seattle, Washington. Joe Fiorella, Drums, Buffalo, New York. Charles McConnell, bass, Chicago, Illinois. Lloyd Ellis, guitar, Pensacola, Florida. Bill Rufo, accordion, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, rangers for the band were Charles McConnell, Don Dalen, Ray Fritz. Uh, assistant directors were K.R. St Stillwell, Kenny, and Charlie Rudica. So I thought it'd be kind of nice that uh, we get these guys down. And with this band being recorded today with the modern facilities, what a great sound it would be. It's been my pleasure talking to you, and uh, uh, I'm so pleased again that I could have been a part of this. Incidentally, I forgot to mention that Charlie Rudica was from Chicago, Illinois, Al Fitzgerald, Columbus, Ohio, and Ray Fritz from Rochester, New York. Mr. Charlie Rudica, I might just wind up saying that Charlie came here after he got out of the service, uh, perhaps as to my talking to him uh, during our days in the service, that Las Vegas was a good place for him. And uh, he was here but a very short time till Lou Basil grabbed him up and he played trombone in the, the Sahara Hotel Band there for quite some time until he crossed a railroad crossing one night from his home going to work and a train accident took his life. Okay, I guess that'll just about wind it up. Um, I might say uh, how happy I was to be home with my wife and my two daughters. Diane was so little, it was so cute, she, uh, she couldn't figure out whether, whether I'd come there to stay or what. But, uh, oh, it was just wonderful to be with my dear wife and my two daughters, whom I had missed so much while being gone. Incidentally, as to my work, uh, the plant out at Basic had folded up. That was a war baby, and uh, there was nothing there. You know, the, its purpose was to make incendiary bombs, and uh, 
So, uh, however, they did make a job for uh, myself and uh, and a couple other guys, Dave Luce and Bill Voss, and uh, as to uh, dispatchers. Well, I was working a straight get graveyard shift, and uh, no way did I like that. And it so happened that one day I ran into Chick Flexer, who run Railroad Pass Casino, and he asked me, he said, what are you doing? And I told him, and he said, do you like what you're doing? I said, no. He said, well, listen, why don't you get a little band together and come on out to the pass and play? I said, what do you mean, every night? He said, yes. I said, how long can I stay? He says, you can stay as long as you like. So uh, that I did do. So that was a turning point right there. But I said to my dear wife, if I ever get back with the Bureau of Reclamation, believe me for sure, I, I'm going to stick like glue until I reach retirement age. Because that dam down there had re really been a big part of me. So fortunately, I did get back after a while and... Uh, well, that's it, right there. And I stayed there until I did retire. Okay.